Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming tonight to my talk. My name is Jessica Ray. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington in Seattle. And today, or tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about the work that I started doing as a postdoc at Berkeley and have been continuing at the University of Washington. And it addresses a growing environmental concern, which we think a lot about in the Seattle area, which is urban stormwater and the complications that arise from contaminants in urban stormwater. So this is um, you know, an issue that, again, we care about a lot in Seattle and in the Seattle area, but it's going to be a significant environmental concern in the future. So tonight's talk is about the work that my group has been doing to address this growing environmental issue. This impacts the global climate change that are going to, you know, even further uh, increase the effects that we're seeing already, including some stats here that, according to King County, one third of water pollution in Washington state comes from stormwater runoff. And um, as you all know, we have a booming uh, fish or you know salmon and, and fish industry here, and 50% of all salmon and steelhead runs in the Puget Sound are considered unhealthy due to contamination of water in the Puget Sound from stormwater runoff. So what do we do about this? I would argue that in many cities, this is the current approach of how we manage stormwater. It happens, right? Storm rain falls from the sky. Um, in cases where it's poorly managed, we have um, frequent instances of street flooding, which is the image on the top left here. And so stormwater is viewed as a nuisance. You know, we need rain, obviously, but we just have to get it off of the street and on to somewhere else as quickly as possible. So we don't have street flooding or rain backing up into people's basements, for example. But there are, of course, better ways to manage urban stormwater. Here are just a few examples. The top example is a, a case where, you know, you can take advantage of something like a man-made reservoir, essentially, to harvest stormwater, and then you could potentially use that to, say, irrigate this nearby park. If you are in an urban area like Seattle, of course, space to build something like that is limited, so you have to rely on these decentralized approaches, such as these cutouts and parking lots that I'm sure you all see. Um, there are a bunch of these small rain gardens and bioswales about, and uh, this kind of uh, permeable or pervious pavement that allows for, you know, some grass and some stormwater infiltration to occur even in um, a really a densely populated area that otherwise would have um, been completely covered. And we can even go a step beyond that to, again, think of new uses for stormwater that we haven't really considered before. So uh, Seattle Public Utilities and other cities are starting to incentivize these alternate approaches to stormwater, including the RainWise program shown here. So I, I snapped this picture when I was out walking my dog uh, one day. So there are a lot of these cisterns at folks' homes where they can capture their local stormwater from their roof and then use it to water their, their lawns. And we could, on a larger city level, use that stormwater to irrigate parks and our homes so we don't have to rely on our existing drinking water source to, to do so. And, you know, in the future, we might even need to rely on stormwater as a drinking water source. So this was part of the research I was doing at UC Berkeley as a postdoc is they were, you know, cities like LA that don't get a lot of rain and are really pressed to find alternate water sources. We're looking at any available water source possible. So um, that could be another use for stormwater, for example. But of course, you all might be thinking, we can't just use stormwater as is, especially in a city like Seattle, because of all of these engineered surfaces that the, uh, that the stormwater is going to come into contact with before it gets um, either discharged to the sound, or if we are imagining these future scenarios where we could reuse that stormwater. So here are, you know, just snapshots of a typical suburb and a downtown kind of metropolis. And of these two images, um, I do a little quiz when I give this lecture <laughs> in a classroom, but I'll just um, go ahead and, and add some of these examples here of all of the different types of contaminants that can be conveyed by the stormwater into the Puget Sound as the stormwater, again, is interacting with these engineered surfaces. 
So these compounds range from fairly benign species to really toxic and persistent uh, compounds. So unfortunately, it's the presence of these contaminants that are really inhibiting our ability to use stormwater in these alternate approaches. In fact, so Ed's here, as well as Mike, <laughs> so there, um, Ed and Mike published a paper in Science recently that identified a compound in tire rubber that was leaching into stormwater, and that was responsible for the pre-spawn mortality of coho salmon, and that's been getting a lot of coverage. It's really interesting stories. If you haven't read the paper, I highly encourage you to do so, and I can include that um, in the chat later for folks who are interested. Okay, so there are clear and demonstrated problems with the fact that we have these contaminants in stormwater, right? So researchers like um, Ed and, and Mike and are trying to put together or have rather identified problems with stormwater that need to be addressed. And this is going to be, Sorry, this is going to be clear for us because we need, you know, new approaches to how we manage stormwater presently to accommodate increasing populations and increasing urbanization. The problem with systems like this is that, you know, they're not very efficient for storm or contaminant removal in these systems. So, for example, this grass whale uh, would be represented by this uh, bar here. And here we have um, some representative contaminants on the, um, the x-axis here on the y-axis are reporting data for the, the sites that are collecting this information and the removal efficiency for these contaminants. And this figures quite a, a lot to take in, but here's some takeaways. Few sites that are tracking stormwater flows in these systems are reporting data of any kind. And those that are, are reporting pretty low or variable contaminant removal. So um, clearly we have a problem here. And this is also concerning considering that there are many contaminants that um, we are not even tracking that are not represented here. So what my group is doing is we are thinking about the way we currently you know, manage stormwater in these types of systems like a rain garden. And so when it rains, of course, you have this influx of contaminants and you can, what's done now typically is conventional materials are added in these systems, such as sand or gravel or compost. And we can rely on, you know, microbes, for example, to facilitate biodegradation of some compounds, but it's not going to be enough as the data in the previous slide indicates. So my group, like I mentioned, is investigating new low-cost engineered materials that can be augmented in these systems to promote contaminant removal. So I'll describe a few examples here uh, of the work that we're doing in my group. Uh, but first, uh, where we're thinking about um, going forward is ways to combine materials to maximize contaminant removal and then testing them in different scenarios. So for example, we can think about amending some previous pavement with our materials, so stormwater contaminants are being treated as the rainwater kind of flows through. We can do some lab scale testing or field, you know, pilot level testing with columns packed with these reactive materials. And we can even mimic a rain garden in our lab with, um, and adding these materials to track contaminant flow and removal in those systems. So these are just some options of what our group is doing. Okay, so in the interest of time, I'm going to, again, give you two examples. I might have to kind of go quickly through some of the slides to make, to make room for questions later, but we'll see how far we get. Okay, so one material that our group is investigating is an iron oxide. And we are investigating this because many reasons. Iron oxides are pretty ubiquitous in the environment. They're also very environmentally benign. And this particular iron oxide is called ferrate. Here's an image of the ferrate that we generated in lab. And what you need to know is that the chemical properties of the ferrate um, iron oxide are such that it's um, able to degrade organic compounds. So here are some reactions associated with um, the ferrate uh, decomposing in water to form iron three species and iron three is the same iron that you would find um, for example in rust. So again, these irons, you know, 
safe to use. And this particular form of iron is really beneficial because it can be used to disinfect water. It can be used to transform some organic compounds like pesticides and plasticizers. And um, the iron three species that form from the decomposition of ferrite can be used to remove trace metals. And for example, um, here are some common disinfectants that we use in water treatment. What uh, we're being compared to here is the strength of that disinfectant. And the higher the number here, the stronger the disinfectant. And you can see that ferrite is in fact uh, the strongest disinfectant of the options we have available to us that are commonly used in water treatment. So this is great, but very not really stable. So when it reacts in water, it reacts very quickly. And that's not what we want, especially for an application like stormwater. We want prolonged treatment so that we can maximize that contaminant removal. So there have been some studies that show that silica stabilizes the, those transformations, the reactions of ferrate in water. So here are just a bunch that show that when you add silica to the ferrate and then introduce some organic compound, like this study investigated caffeine, for example, you can catalyze the, um, the transformation of the caffeine in this instance. So it helps to slow down the reaction process long enough for the ferrate to do its job in the water. So we're taking advantage of this known and demonstrated property of silica to stabilize the ferrates for stormwater treatment by coating the ferrate on sand because sand is about 90% silica, which is very convenient for us because sand is, is already commonly used in rain gardens, for example. So the idea would be to coat the ferrate onto sand with the idea, again, that the sand is going to slow down the ferrate reaction kinetics. And say we introduce a representative trace uh, organic compound that you would find in stormwater. So diuron, for example, is an herbicide. The ferrate can react with these compounds and transform the compounds in a way that makes the compound um, easy to biodegrade, for example. So it helps to facilitate the degradation of certain compounds like uh, diuron and other herbicides. And then the benefit of this particular media is that when that ferrate reacts with the organic compounds, then again, you form an iron three phase as opposed to um, this, this iron oxide that we started with. And iron three has been widely demonstrated in the literature. And we know this, um, I've done PhD work, uh, work on this, um, that ferrate and, or sorry, that the iron three that forms from this kind of transformation of our starting material can bind with heavy metals like uh, lead and cadmium. So essentially you get dual treatment of both organic contaminants in stormwater like herbicides and pesticides and plasticizers. And you also get treatment of heavy metals like nickel, cadmium, copper, lead. So you get two treatments in one with this media. And um, my PhD student is doing some work to try and stabilize this coating, understand how the iron uh, phases change over time, and we're starting to do some characterization of the contaminant removal for both trace metals and trace organics. And I think I just said all this, but <laughs> at any rate, we're answering questions like, um, how stable is that iron? Does it leach into the water, for example, which again, isn't necessarily a bad thing because iron's you know, a benign uh, species, but we just want to understand um, how stable the iron is, and then all of these possible competing interactions with the, the ferrate and the um, this kind of transformation product that forms. Okay, I'm actually going to skip this slide. Sorry about that. It was just describing ways to stabilize the, the ferrate in the interest of time. I want to make sure there's plenty of time for questions. Okay, so that was one material that we're investigating. So this iron oxide would allow us to, again, degrade certain compounds in water, in the storm water, but then also to remove heavy metals in water, which is um, a really cool uh, benefit to using that specific form of iron oxide. Now, this other material is um, one that is more similar to what you would find in existing water treatment. It's based on a uh, material called biochar. 
So for those who aren't familiar, bio and biochar comes from biomass. So you can use, uh, for example, usually agricultural food waste products like um, coconut shells, rice poles, uh, like reed straw, things like that. If you burn those, um, the agricultural food waste products at high temperatures, you generate something that looks like charcoal, hence char in the biochar. And if you zoom in with a microscope to look at the structure of the biochar, you can, at times, depending on what starting material you use, you can really see these long defined pores in the structure of the biochar, which is great for removing a wide variety of contaminants in water. So this particular um, material is based on uh, a material called activated carbon, which is very commonly used in water and wastewater treatment processes to absorb contaminants in water. So the, I'll talk about this later, but the benefits using something like biochar is you're taking what would otherwise be a waste product and you're converting it into an adsorbent, something that could be used, for example, in water treatment. So of the many options we have available to us to generate the biochar in terms of our biomass feedstock, we decided to use coffee grounds, used coffee grounds, I should say. So not, of course, a fresh coffee ground. So uh, this is great because, as you all know, we're living in the coffee capital of the world. We have a seemingly abundant source of used coffee grounds available to us uh, to use for this research. And in fact, the coffee grounds that we're getting to do this work came from um, UW catering services here on the Seattle campus. And we're talking to companies like Starbucks who have this grounds for your garden program where they literally give away <laughs> their used coffee grounds. They just package it up, they leave it out at some Starbucks locations. You can pick it up, you can add it to your um, fertilizer when you're you know, in your garden. So this, um, again, is a very widely available source for us to use to do this kind of analysis. Okay, so here's an image of what that biochar looks like once it's uh, you know, burned in the oven that we're using in the lab to generate it. And I'll show you some results from some preliminary testing that we've done with this material. So the first thing we wanted to do is to try burning it at different temperatures, because if you burn it at high temperature versus a low temperature, it's going to impact the structure, the final structure of the biochar, which will then, of course, have implications for the types and amounts of contaminants that can be removed. So a lot of the discussion I'll talk about in the last like 15 minutes or so of the talk is around one compound in particular, which is perfluorooctane sulfonic acid or PFOS. Here's the structure here. A lot of you might have heard about um, PFOS and PFOA before or just PFAS in general. PFOS is within the class of compounds called PFAS. These are synthetic, uh, heavily fluorinated organic compounds that are used in a lot of non-stick and water-resistant applications. And unfortunately, they're pretty toxic and very environmentally pervasive. So we wanted to start with that compound as a kind of you know, indicator compound to see how well our material works for absorption. Okay, so again, we examined different pyrolysis temperatures. We did a just a quick batch test, just mix PFOS with the biochar at different uh, biochar to PFOS ratios, and we tested different pyrolysis or uh, burning temperatures at 400, 600, and 800 degrees, and basically saw very low removal. So that was disheartening. <laughs> we um, were really hopeful that this material would work well for us, and so we wanted to figure out a way to potentially enhance the uh, PFOS removal uh, with the biochar. So again, no effective temperature, poor PFOS removal. And we also noticed that the available surface area is quite small for uh, all the different uh, temperatures that we investigated. So we hypothesized that, sorry, my dog's drinking water. You can hear that in the background. Um, we hypothesized that if you increase the surface area, then you might also increase the PFOS removal. So that's what we did next. 
Okay, so to increase the surface area, we performed an activation step, a chemical activation step, which is actually very similar to the activation step that's done for the activated carbon that's used in existing water and wastewater treatment systems. We're just doing the chemical activation out on a much um, smaller degree using less uh, chemical activator. So we investigated two different activators. These are both pretty common basic materials. So um, sodium hydroxide and potassium hydroxide in dark green and, and light green here. And um, these were mixed in with the pre-burned biochar to then test for um, the, uh, you know, how well we can increase the PFOS removal if we also expand the surface area. So we tested a range of ratios of the chemical activating agent with the mass of the biochar that we used, and we um, decided to use this um, this one-to-one -one ratio of the chemical activator and the biochar. So um, we're in, in kind of this realm here. And we um, also decided to use potassium hydroxide as opposed to sodium hydroxide, which as you can see, resulted in low PFOS removal. So when we did this, the surface area of the biochar increased from about 10 square meter per gram to about 900 square meter per gram. So significant increase in the surface area, which we could see really helped with the percent PFOS removal. And something else we were considering was, um, you know, if you use one batch of coffee grounds as opposed to a different batch, would you get similar results? And so, whoops, sorry about that. Um, so what we did was we got a new batch of used coffee grounds from uh, the UW Catering Service and then did this test again and found basically the same percent PFOS removal with a completely different batch of used coffee grounds. So that was very promising for us because we don't want this, you know, large heterogeneity in performance for PFOS removal or contaminant removal in general. Okay, um, running low on time, sorry, <laughs> keeping track. Um, what we're doing now is a bunch of different um, activities with this material with respect to removal of target compounds like PFOS, which we know is very toxic, very pervasive, but also um, just leveraging that material to enable contaminant removal in urban stormwater. So we're testing it against the commercially available activated carbon. And um, depending on the, the kind of water chemistry available, we have pretty similar removal. So that's really promising for us with respect to, you know, thinking about replacing the activated carbon, which is most, um, most often sourced from charcoal, so very non-sustainable or unsustainable material as opposed to just using coffee grounds, which we have a lot of um, at our disposal. So we're answering questions again um, with all the media that we're investigating for stormwater treatment. What types of contaminants can we remove? How much of those contaminants can we remove? What's the, the lifetime of our material before it can no longer remove or degrade any contaminants before it needs to be replaced? So these kinds of uh, questions we're answering in the lab right now with respect to our material. Um, this material in particular, the coffee biochar, we are in the process of filing a, a full patent for this compound and we've gotten some funding from um, the innovation hub here on campus to potentially license this technology. Okay, so um, just some quick results and then I'll end, I promise, and leave time for questions. But we are starting to answer those questions of how long will the material uh, remove contaminants for? So here on the left, we have packed some small lab scale columns with different weight percentages of the a coffee ground biochar material. So we have about three weight percent here, 0.5 weight percent biochar here, and then some just sand only, which is what we're amending these columns with. And we have been feeding um, these columns with a synthetic stormwater matrix containing a bunch of different representative uh, trace organic contaminants found in urban stormwater. Here are some structures here and the kind of source of these contaminants. And here's just one snapshot of data that we have. We've been, we finally stopped these experiments because it was getting 
really cumbersome for us to keep sampling from these columns because we started sampling in January and to stop them recently. So they have been working really, really well with respect to removing all of these contaminants. So here I'm showing uh, normalized removal on the Y axis and on the X axis, I'm showing the pore volume or the volume of water treated, volume of storm water treated. So um, we're doing more analysis again with this material to, um, to kind of more, um, to quantify more the uh, amount of contaminant removed and then do some estimates on when the material would need to be replaced. Okay, so I'll end with just two more slides here. So um, I'll leave some time for questions, but some of the benefits to what we're trying to, um, I should say, do with the materials that we developed is make sure they're low cost, make sure they are environmentally benign so that we don't introduce toxicity to an application like you know, a rain garden where we could add our materials to enhance contaminant removal. In the case of the biochar, we have some unique advantages compared to that commercial activated charcoal that's used in water treatment. Um, it's more sustainable. Uh, it's sourced from a food source that's very commonly separated. Like I mentioned, the, the grounds for your garden program at Starbucks. And what we're investigating is the ability of um, the used coffee ground biochar to be composted to help um, degrade those contaminants, which you obviously can't do if you are sourcing your activated carbon material from charcoal. So again, clear advantages there. Um, folks who are interested in this work that we're doing include the Port of Seattle. They've been talking to us about um, all the stormwater management they have to do on site. And they're limited, of course, to you know um, where they can do this kind of treatment because of the, the nature of the port. Um, partnering with Ed and others at the Center for Urban Waters to um, pilot our technologies both there and on campus. Um, there's a Department of Ecology program that certifies new technology for stormwater uh, treatment and applications. And then there are some nonprofits like the People for Progress in India that are really excited about our low cost materials that can remove or degrade contaminants in water. So that's really it, I promise. Uh, here's an image or some images of my group members. Um, a lot of the, of course, did all of all of the data that I presented here. So with that, I hope there's time for some questions. But I didn't talk too much. No, it was awesome. Thank you very much, Jess. It was <laughs> wonderful. Uh, virtual round of applause for you. Um, folks, <laughs> if you would like to, um, you can actually turn on your videos. I allowed you to do that as long as, since I think I know most people, hopefully we'll get no Zoom bombing tonight. Um, so uh, uh, before we get to questions, if you have your questions, go ahead and chat them in there. But what we're going to do is give away some uh, some awesome swag. So again, the Grit City Think and Drink socks, oops, they disappeared. Uh, Grit City Think and Drink socks. So if you need a pair, um, it is getting close to the holidays. So these are, are, are amazing gift. Uh, the, well, they are stocking, but you could put them in stockings as well as a stocking stuffer. Um, so to give these away, um, uh, Jim right here comes up with random uh, uh, factoids that are somewhat uh, loosely related to tonight's talk. So um, any uh, choice of what these factoids are are totally on uh, myself. Um, hopefully they will work out. So uh, when you hear the question, be the first one to uh, chat the correct answer. If you don't get it right the first time, just keep chatting uh, answers until you get it and somebody will win socks. I have two different questions. So two pairs of socks uh, will go away tonight. So get your fingers ready. Uh, here we go. So the first question is uh, quite related. What percentage of the Puget Sound drainage basin is impervious surface? So how much of it is pavement or roof or other material that uh, doesn't drain well? So what percentage of the Puget Sound basin is paved or impervious surface? Chat your answers. Oh, nobody's got anything yet. I was just gonna say, I think we should have giveaways at all talks. <laughs> Make them more enjoyable. 60%. Awesome. That might be a little high. I would go down 50. Keep it coming. This is the entire Puget Sound drainage basin, not just the city area. So the entire dra area that drains to Puget Sound. I was trying not to be city specific. 12%. 
28. Anybody else? Mike, I don't think I've seen you. Some other folks, got any answers? 38%, 20. Well, as of right now, the winner goes to Leanne uh, with 12%. It turns out 4% of the entire area is actually impervious surface if you include everything. So 4% uh, is the answer. Um, still a lot of area um, when you think about the size of Puget Sound Basin. So Leanne, you get a pair of socks. Uh, and uh, Leanne is saying that someone else can have her pair of socks. So um, maybe we'll send that pair to our speaker for tonight so that she has a great pair of socks um, to share. All right, second question. Here you go, get your fingers ready. Tonight's speaker went to two universities with the same animal as a mascot. What is it? Bear, Mike Dodd gets it right off the top. He's got it nailed. Now they are different color bears or different kinds, I believe, but at least they were both bears. So uh, Mike, uh, so what I need from folks uh, is I just need a way, because since we are not in person, I just need a mailing address chatted to me. Nobody else will see it. So, or you can email me afterwards. So send me your mailing address and the size of your socks, because it turns out we have well, two sizes. So are you either a small or a medium slash large? Uh, let us know and we'll get those socks to you. Um, but it does mean that you have to show those off proudly um, as everybody does. So uh, thank you for playing with the uh, swag. And now we'll get to the question and answer. If anybody has questions for our speaker, please chat those in there. Thanks, Leanne, and for the socks. <laughs> I will use them. That's right. <laughs> um, I'll start us off with one question. So you were had some initial data. So have you been able to figure out roughly how long or, you know, for how long you could have these things in a rain garden before you'd have to switch them out, at least with your initial look at data? Uh, yes. Yeah. So right now we're actually partnering with some folks um, from the renew it, or sorry, from the research center that I was a part of while I was at Berkeley, there's still a team there that's doing a lot of the uh, stormwater treatment research, and they've got a really nice program and kind of code set up to help us do that analysis. We're working with them to do that now. I will say that the material that we have developed in terms of its performance is comparable to a biochar that I was investigating as a postdoc. And that biochar was made from um, pine needles and not coffee grounds. But um, we hypothesize that with about eight grams of material, sorry, four grams of material that you could treat, I think it was something like 800 gallons of water. I need to double check that, but it's a lot. <laughs> a little goes a long way. And it's um, what we're really excited about is one, again, like verifying that information to answer those kinds of questions because what we don't want to do is add some kind of uh, engineered material into a rain garden that only lasts for a year because then you'd have to dig it up, replace it, refresh it with, um, new material with fresh material that's ready to go. So the benefit of using something like a biochar is that, again, a little goes a long way. And you could almost think about adding a layer of the biochar at the kind of bottom end of your rain garden or basin so that any contaminants that remain um, get removed with the biochar. It's kind of a polishing material before that water is conveyed to a drain down to the, you know, Puget Sound. So cool. we're still investigating that number. Sounds awesome. But we're hopeful. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Ed. He says, why do different compounds give different performance in the biochar absorption system? Thanks, Ed. So <laughs> the, um, the difference in removal, we hypothesize for some contaminants is 
uh, based on their hydrophobicity. So the hydrophobicity describes how well the particular compound will prefer to, uh, you know, stay in water or to, you know, move to something that um, is you know, not water. <laughs> so the surface of the um, the biochar or the biochar that we have created is also very hydrophobic. So we hypothesize that compounds that are more hydrophobic will um, are going to absorb the um, the hydrophobic compounds better than the compounds that are actually you know pretty fine in in water. They don't mind being in water so much. So. There's that. There's also um, compounds that are negatively charged. So uh, the biochar that we um, are the biochar that we've developed is negatively charged, like a lot of the activated carbon materials are. And depending on the chemical structure of the organic compound in particular, if it's negatively charged, it might not bind so well to the biochar because of repulsive forces. But um, it really just depends on the, the the compound and you know what portion of the compound is, for example, hydrophobic versus what portion of the compound is responsible for that negative charge. Complicated answer. Got another one for you. Morgan would like to know: Are there classes of stormwater contaminants that are low hanging fruit that is easy targets for removal? Um. Yeah, so I think the the compounds that are low hanging fruit are the larger compounds. So, or sorry, the the larger contaminants. So, if you think about the slide where I have the suburb and the kind of downtown metropolis, there's of course larger um, contaminants that we can remove in these rain gardens, like just through physical interaction. Think about straining pasta in your kitchen. So, if it's you know larger than say a grain of sand and a grain of sand that are next to each other, then of course you're going to get removal there. So that's the, the best example I can provide for low hanging fruit. I think like literal waste um, or debris that ends up in these systems. Um, what becomes tricky are the contaminants that are dissolved in water. So those are more likely to Kind of traverse through the system and then end up in the drain to the Puget Sound. And those are the compounds that we want to remove with our engineered materials. So in addition to heavy metals like lead, cadmium, copper, zinc that we want to remove, as well as the, you know, those flame retardants and those plasticizers and herbicides and insecticides, something that we're also interested in removing are um, nutrients. So for example, um, nitrates and, and phosphates, which if we have too much of those will promote those algal blooms that are really harmful for surface waters in particular. So that's a, another high area of interest for us. And there are a lot of studies using other biochars to, to move, remove those nutrients in storm water. So we're hoping that our used coffee ground biochar is a good candidate for that. Cool. Um, question I was thinking of is, how does this work if it wasn't as part of a rain garden? I know that treating mm -hmm. stormwater, like stormwater treatment that goes in storm drains is actually a big um, technological wish, I think. Yeah. How does, how would this deal at that kind of fast flow, fast through rate that happens there versus something in a bioswale? Right. So there's, um, there's so many questions to answer there with respect to the nature of the flow. Right now, we're, you know, as the, the preliminary data that I, I showed you is a small glimpse of what we've been working on, but right now it's primarily focused on understanding the material properties and understanding the contaminant removal. And then where we're going is, you know, what happens when you, for example, vary the flow. So if you have something like we've seen over the last week or so, where you have heavy rain events, and you get a large flux of, of water through these systems versus a typical light misty rain um, that we expect in, in the Seattle area. So what happens there if you have a contaminant absorbed onto the biochar, for example, um, will it desorb if you kind of flush water through that system at, at a faster rate than you would normally expect? Also, what happens if you get some rain event 
and then it doesn't rain for five days and your material kind of dries out in the system. What happens when it rains again? Um, do you have more mobility or transport of the contaminants? So that's where we're going with this research. And the nice thing about the, the small lab scale columns that I showed towards the end of my talk is that with that setup, we can more or less mimic these systems. So we can vary the flow rate, for example, we can start and stop. We can, um, eventually we can add, for example, um, little sample ports along the length of the column to really understand and track how the contaminants are moving through those systems. And those will help answer some of those questions. Cool, thank you. Uh, Chelsea wants to know, um, who's from Tacoma, uh, does the loading rate impact removal performance? So kind of similar to what you, have you studied, have you looked at that at all yet, or is that to come? Right, so the loading rate being, you know, the amount of contaminants already absorbed onto the material. Yeah, so that's a great question. We, like I said, the, the kind of, the good thing about the biochar is that it, does appear to have very high removal capacity for a wide variety of compounds. Some of the problems with biochar, there are many, right? Everything's got a downside to it. But one of the problems is that um, it's non-selective, which is actually great for something like stormwater treatment because stormwater has unfortunately many different types of contaminants present so the biochar is going to hopefully remove things like nutrients, maybe even like pathogens, heavy metals, and organic compounds. And so I think the loading is going to be a lot faster than what we're showing for the analysis that we've done already with just a select few organic compounds. And what we're doing with actually another branch of research that we're investigating is if you have a loaded biochar? Um, is there a way to regenerate that material to reuse it? And if not, then kind of getting back to the last question, um, how, how fixed are those contaminants onto or in the biochar structure? So um, we can do those tests, like I mentioned, bearing the flow of start and stop to, you know, promote some um, contaminant detachment. And then I'm um, looking at other ways to kind of make sure that we don't have that uh, that desorption or detachment from the biochar from you know loaded biochar in these systems uh leanne wants to know do you anticipating uh wanting citizens uh donations of coffee grounds at some point or do you anticipate <laughs> uh, these commercial sources like starbucks uh will be able to provide what you want so uh, so when do we start mailing our coffee grounds to <laughs> Uh, I don't think that, you know, household coffees needed <laughs> for this work. There's, um, I pulled a statistic recently about Starbucks. There's something ridiculous, like 170 Starbucks per 100,000 residents in Seattle. So we have plenty, when I say plenty, <laughs> plenty of source material. In fact, with the UW catering services, they, you know, this was, we're still getting um, coffee grounds from them. But initially when we met and told them about this work, they were really excited about it and wanted to contribute. And they were offering us five gallon drums weekly of <laughs> used coffee grounds. And we told them we could not handle that much because our oven in the lab is only so big and we can only make so much material. So um, yes, I don't know, no household donations anytime soon. I do think, you know, if we describe all the many benefits to Starbucks, that they'd be really eager to kind of hop on board to providing some, you know, source material so we can expand this research outside of the lab. I think that'd be really great. Gotcha. Uh, Amis, if I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, wants to know: all right, Do you envision coming up with various formulations of mixtures of these different materials that you would actually treat with for different? kind of targeted things? Yeah, it's a great question. So there's no silver bullet with respect to any sort of water treatment and urban storm water treatment is no exception to that. So, um, you know, the bulk of the talk was about biochar because um, right now we happen to have more information about that material as opposed to the iron oxide coated sand. But uh, 
as I mentioned, biochar has its limitations as well. So it's important for us to think about stacking materials in a certain way. Maybe we have the, you know, the biochar first as a first pass of treatment, and then we add the iron oxide coated sand, or maybe, you know, like a clay composite or something. So we can think about basically enabling treatment zones within a rain garden or, or bioswale to really maximize removal um, to the fullest degree so that we don't have, if we do have, for example, um, the detachment of contaminants from the biochar, then there's another treatment step downstream to hopefully mitigate uh, pollution of um, the Puget Sound from the urban stormwater. So yeah, that'll be really important for us to investigate. Uh, and our last question we have here from Allison said, you mentioned that the coffee biochar could be composted following use, uh, are you, mm -hmm. or you're working towards that. Do you envision that this compost would eventually be used safely for gardening or agriculture afterwards? Right. So this is, um, I've, been, I've been talking with my lab about this a lot. They're really excited about the potential to compost the, the used biochar. Again, we're thinking about these kind of holistic life to death treatments um, and also thinking about really sustainable treatments. They were really jazzed about the potential to compost. If it works, and that's a big if, we're, I'm actually looking right now at um, collaborating with researchers who do this kind of study to investigate the um, composting and biotransformation or biodegradation of uh, contaminants within uh, within compost or during composting. If we do this and it works to a certain degree, I think we'd have to be very careful about where we recommend the compost for you know, alternate use. So for example, I would hesitate to say that if you know, once the biochar is spent, then you could compost it and then use it to grow crops. We don't think that's going to happen. So um, we need to you know, do that kind of assessment um, that's on our, our very long list of things to test for this material so that we can answer those questions of if the composting works and then what to do with the compost afterwards. Yeah, and it probably also depends on the composting process because some of them right. are higher yeah. temperatures, some of them are lower temperature and quick throughput. And so that that's actually why some compost facilities can't handle like compostable containers because they can't, they're not the right kind of process. So that makes right. sense. That's cool. Um, sounds like you have your work cut out for you um, for the <laughs> next several decades. Um, uh, thank you very much for a great talk tonight. Thank you all for coming. It's been nice to see you folks. Um, hope to see you uh, the second Tuesday of November um, for our next talk about furniture, um, which will be quite a change from uh, this uh, month's talk. And thanks again to Dr. Jessica Ray for an amazing talk and uh, hope to see you all again. Have a wonderful evening and congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the invite. This was fun.